Uh, so if Tesla is able to make the smartest driver based on that data and that compute, then the question is who else can follow them quickly enough to then meaningfully compete with them. So let's start off with this, which is it's, it's shocking for Tesla investors to think that people think that Waymo and Uber is going to win, but it, it, there are many people who are on the other side who, who are shocking to them that they think that Tesla investors think that we are going to win. It, it's kind of this weird thing. So let's try to put ourselves in their shoes. Listen to this guy. He, um, Jeff Lutz kind of presented, he took a video of this guy talking about Uber and what he thinks and how Uber is going to win. This guy says, cars are cars. They'll all drive autonomously, clean and charge themselves at the lowest cost with near zero engineering investment, cut and paste. He thinks this is a commodity, Uber's gonna win. And in fact, he thinks no one else is gonna win except Uber because He's so much smarter than Jensen Wong. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> understands AI and self-driving cars. And the narrative now is who cares about who has the cars? This is gonna be a software business and a network effects business. And Tesla's just one of several players that's gonna have an app and a bunch of cars. There's only one player that's gonna to try to connect them all and own the consumer. So, the, you know, these narratives about like the net. Yeah, I don't know what he was gonna say there. I actually don't know who he is. I um, well, apologize, but. Uh... I mean, I would agree with him that it is gonna be a software business and a network effects business. And if you could magically snap your fingers and provide the software that could drive the cars to every car make of every model at the same time, then the value capture really would be the person who's the intermediary between the consumer and all of these vehicles. Um, but that's, uh, you know, like I referenced earlier, Jensen Wong himself said that today, Tesla is far ahead when it comes to driving technology that is fully based on neural nets, and they have doubled down on the scaling laws um, that are paying dividends in all other areas of AI. They're the only company that is all in on the most compute possible and the most data possible to make the smartest driving software, to this guy's point, possible. Uh, so if Tesla is able to make the smartest driver, based on that data and that compute, then the question is who else can follow them quickly enough to then meaningfully compete with them? Um, we'll talk about that more as the rest of this episode plays out. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be, it is definitely gonna come down to the software. Okay, so uh, yeah, so much to share, but let's assume that they're correct. But they, they, they just assume that it's gonna happen really quickly. I mean, we heard one analyst tell us that in three months after Tesla launches this, there'll be other competitors and everyone will have it. Three months? Let's say that they do can copy. Let's say it is real software that you can copy, which it isn't. It's neural nets, it's servers. It's like you have to have the largest supercomputer in the world. You have to have training and you have to have the data to train it. This is not just copy and paste software that you used to be able to do, but let's say you do. Uh, take Tesla's uh -oh. own example. Uh -oh. The Cybertruck has not been <laughs> the easiest vehicle in the world for Tesla to get yeah. their own FSD software working on and working to the same level of quality as their other vehicles. If it's this difficult and, you know, they've done it like it's it's great software. They've they've really done an outstanding job yeah. of porting FSD to the Cybertruck. Um, but if it's this difficult for Tesla to do that for yeah. one of their own vehicles that was engineered from the ground up to work with this software, how much more difficult is it going to be for any yeah. of these other companies to just copy it? Yeah. And I'm just saying, let, let okay, it's not going to happen in three months. We know that. So that statement that it's going to happen in three months is ridiculous. But let's say it happens in a year, two years, three years. Like by that point, what would the world be like and who you're competing with and who's going to have the lowest cost? All that needs to be considered. Like, yes, maybe your world is, is uh, you know, commoditized, but when does it become commoditized? It's not going to be in a year, not going to be th till three years, as far as we're understanding, because unless we heard, unless there's a car manufacturer out there that hasn't told us that they're already going to create millions of cars with autonomy, autonomous ready cars, 
I do yeah. understand where the argument comes from that, you know, everyone will have something like this in three months. I think it is a severe misunderstanding of the first principles of how we get there. But, you know, open AI has been the leader in AI, right. Chat. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. LLMs mm -hmm. for a long time. They've managed to they're... maintain their lead, but there's a lot of other companies copied. that are nipping on their heels. And yeah. so you think, man, you know, if that's what happens mm -hmm. in these LLMs, then of course the same type mm -hmm. of thing could be possible in the world of artificial driving. And mm -hmm. the yeah. difference between open AI and all these other companies that are pursuing this and driving is that driving data itself is much more siloed and much more difficult to acquire that all of these LLMs, whether they're trained by Google, whether they're trained by OpenAI, whether they're trained by, you know, Elon uh, with XAI, like they're all training on text data that is available on the internet. And everyone has access to the internet. Like there's this huge data source that yeah. is the open internet that all of these different companies can have access to. And so since this is a common, like a, an open mm -hmm. source and commonly available data resource, then all you need is the knowledge of the algorithms and then the compute to go and train your LLM model that can go compete with open AI. So that's one thing. Now let's just say, in this hypothetical world that maybe we live in, that 90% of all of the AI compute is bound up in this race for better and better LLMs. No one is allocating their GPUs to this artificial driving use case. And the data that you need in order to train that driver is almost oh, impossible yeah. to acquire. Who's yeah. going to win? Like this That's is like... Big. Yeah. Elon has made a completely differentiated bet. No one else has allocated the amount of cute compute to this problem that Elon has. And still to this day, there's not a single manufacturer that is putting the computers and the full set of cameras in every single one of the vehicles that they manufacture at scale mm -hmm. to acquire the driving data. There is not, you know, there's not an open internet corollary for driving data that other manufacturers can just snap their fingers mm -hmm. and go out and get access to. And if you don't have that data, you need like this, it, th this is such a hard problem. Like the data problem in mm -hmm. AI yep. is one of the biggest problems of AI and people that are following this from the sidelines don't understand that even for LLMs, this is a huge problem. We just don't see it because that's only the nerds talk about how big this problem is and only the biggest nerds. And, you know, when you listen to them have these conversations, you don't understand what the heck it is that they're talking about. And that's already a big problem with the, the open internet being that data source. So this is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just an insanely difficult issue. challenge. Now I will say that of the players that are out there, Google is probably in a very prime position to be able to ramp up their efforts to acquire additional driving data from non-traditional, like from non-vehicle sources. Although they do have, you know, they've got a lot of their um, Google Maps vehicles that go around and they, you know, gather all this 360. I don't yeah. know if it's video data or not. I would assume that it's originally captured in, in video. And so they, they do actually have a good resource for this and you know, the Waymo fleet is yeah. one of the larger non-Tesla fleets for acquiring data. So they do have some ability to acquire data. It's just, you know, an order of magnitude lower than what yeah. Tesla has. Let's take a look at the Waymo. They are considered to be the biggest uh, competitor. So Waymo made some huge milestones. So first of all, Jan of the Universe was pointing out Austin is ready for robotaxis. Waymo rides made up 20% of all Uber rides in Austin in late March. Every fifth ride was done by a robotaxi. This is a choose Uber, right? So Uber partnered with Waymo. Um, they only have 300 cars, by the way. So when you click on, I want an Uber X, if you're lucky, you know, 
one of those 300 cars, it's a Jaguar R-Pace operated by Waymo, it comes up. But uh, Waymo rides made up 20% of all Uber rides in Austin. So the the idea being that, you know, uh, people are used to doing this already. We're going to go head to head, com compete with them. Same time, you had Waymo kind of announce that um, they've hit their 10,000, 10 million paid rides uh, total. Sounds like a lot. So we're going to ask you, when do we think that Tesla might get there? But um, that's the argument, right? Waymo is the only company, one of the few companies, and there's many in China, that is able to already have paid robo-taxi rides. Tesla is zero. But Tesla's going to do this uh, next month. So let's listen in to this uh, interview by CNBC with the co-CEO of Waymo, and we'll break it down and listen to what they're saying. Musk also adding he thinks Tesla's autonomous driving technology will be safer than that of Alphabet, Alphabet owned Waymo. Good day yesterday here on CNBC because George Rabosa was able to catch up with Waymo's co CEO and get her reaction to the interview. And here's Deidre now as well. So they're, they're going back and forth. Of course, the, right now, Waymo is the only one on the actual road doing rides every day, Deirdre. With a fleet of about 1,500 cars, and really, these are two very different visions. For the future of autonomy, you heard Musk lay out his vision. He's arguing that driverless cars should mimic humans, and like he said, the road was made for eyes and brains. He says not lasers, but Waymo's co-CEO, Takedra Mokawan, he she tells me that the vehicle needs to be better than humans, and that means sensors plus AI. Have a listen. You have to be able to see at night. You have to be able to have this vision that's better than humans. Like we, what we're doing is we're replacing humans. We're not asking you to sit behind the wheel and take over the vehicle at a really vulnerable moment. Instead, we're inviting you to sit in the back seat, relax and unwind and get safely to your destination. That's a very different value proposition, but it's one that requires belts and suspenders. And that's the approach that we've taken. Yeah, so that value proposition, it centers firmly around safety. They have a safety hub. They have a track record. And reaching 10 million autonomous trips, that is a milestone that reinforces their approach and goes beyond proof of concept. Remember, this is a business. 1,500 cars in the fleet, 250,000 paid rides per week. Mabakama says that every additional trip at this scale, at this point, it is accelerating the rate at which the Waymo driver is learning. While Musk and Mawakana disagree on how to build and deploy driverless tech, though, they do align on national regulation, guys. She said that, essentially, they are also hoping for it. And she's actually optimistic that it can be done in this term. I want to pause it before she talks about national regulation. So it sounds like Waymo is going to be successful. Do you agree with what she just said? Uh, my point has been, if Waymo is so successful, because that's the way they, they positioned it. Look at them. They're already in all these cities. Why do they only have 1,500 robo-taxis? And why do they only promise to make another 2,000 cars next year? Uh, this is a drop in the bucket. That's not enough. If they were so far ahead, they would have been making 10,000 cars. If they're making so much money, they charge more than Uber does. Uh, more, yeah, more than Uber does. And, uh, you know, they're not making any profit. And that could be the reason why they've not expanded as fast as you think. Um, and they're very, very localized. Like if even in San Francisco, it's a very small geofenced area. Um, yeah, thoughts on what she said. Yeah, I, the the unit economics there. So what you're saying when you're saying, you know, they're not growing very fast. The reason that you're not growing very fast is because your unit economics are not right side up yet. Um, so you don't have the combination of the ability to make money and provide the service at the same time and meet your safety goals. And that's the reality of the the autonomous driving space right now is that that's still impossible. No one has cracked that nut, Waymo included. That's why they're not growing and scaling. Um, that they are on a very positive path right now. You know, they're exponentially growing the number of miles, the number of rides. Um, so the early indications that they could get there are good if they didn't have to compete against someone in a massive way in the not too distant future. Like if there was no such thing as Tesla, mm -hmm. Waymo would definitely look Good like point. the company that mm -hmm. was on the best path to get there. And, you know, they're hypothetically, there is a pathway for them to reduce their reliance on LIDAR to, you know, have a more scalable sensor suite, um, to transition more and more over to neural nets over time. Like all of those things are 
are possible. They are feasible. I don't know, you know, what the, we don't hear, I think the right questions being asked and, you know, Amy has, has a good set of questions for someone like, uh, Takedra about, you know, how do they get from where they are to where they could hypothetically be a head to head competitor with Tesla in the long term? We don't really hear those questions being asked and we'll get into those more here in the, uh, in the near future, but the, really it comes back to the thing that she said that it is a business. And right now as a business, Waymo is not a business that makes money. Mm -hmm. And so they have got to manage their cash burn. Tesla is a business. They do make money. Now FSD is a subset of that business and that part of the company does not make money yet, but Tesla as a business has the ability to more than fund, you know, the development of that software and Google as a business has the ability to subsidize and fund Waymo. The question is, you know, are how committed are they to the Waymo project? How much focus does the Waymo project have from management of Google? And I'm like, this is just my subjective read from the outside looking in. Um, I've actually been extremely impressed over the last several months with Google's finally turning the corner on executing on AI and building it into um, products at scale. My assumption or my, my read of the situation is that right now that is capturing far more of the attention inside of Google than whatever is happening with Waymo. And so I, like, I don't think you're going to get meaningful Demis Hassabis time that is dedicated to solving the Waymo autonomous driving problem. And honestly, I think it would take somebody at Demis's level um, in order to manage that transition for Waymo. 